This is a lecture on Muhammad Jamil Behum's Arabism and Jewry in Syria, written in 1957. Now, Behum, you can see there to the far left, uh, he was a Beiruti, uh, lived in Lebanon, but he also advocated for Syria and, uh, and Lebanon to unite into one nation. Um, he was an interesting figure. Uh, we're going to just look at his remarks here with respect to the question of the uh, Jewish nationalism in Palestine. And I'm wanting to have, to have a look at this particular essay as an example of a response by Arab peoples living in the region to the coming of uh, Jews to Palestine as the formation of the Jewish state, Israel, in Palestine. Now, this is not, I don't think this essay is a particularly, um, historically, I'm not sure, you know, if it's a, a, of enormous significance, but it is significant because it gives us what I see as a, uh, a, a characteristic or representative example to some of the claims of Israeli Jews when the state of Israel was formed. And so again, my, my goal here is not to uh, support any particular political viewpoint, but rather to examine what the positions were at this time, what the responses were, you know, what, what was Zionism, what was the Arabist or Pan-Arab response to Zionism. And I think Behum gives us a pretty good example of a response to Zionism, which rejected many of the claims made by the Jews coming to Palestine at this time. And so this is a, a characteristic of a particular kind of response that, that one would have found in the region at this time. So it's 1957, and I think it has a particular historical importance for that, uh, for that reason. So, Let's uh, again look, if we look at this map here, we can see if we think of Pan-Arabism, we can think of the Zionist movement as Jewish nationalism and it, the, the, the Jewish nationalist movement, the Zionist movement really formed about the same time as the Pan-Arab uh, project was taking shape, the response to the colonization of the Levant by the British and the French after years of uh, being controlled by the Ottomans in, in Turkey. And, uh, and so uh, here we have an, an Arab thinker, an Arab intellectual responding to the challenge of Zionism in, uh, in Palestine, in the, which, you know, after the Israeli Declaration of Independence in 1948. So this would have been some, written some nine years after that uh, time and obviously before the Six-Day War. Uh, now here, also even before uh, Behum in 1938, I just wanted to take this little excerpt from the first Arab Students' Congress, which is the Arab Pledge, definitions, manifestos, of what, what it meant to be an Arab and so on. Um, and we, I'll have, I have other lectures on this same YouTube channel exploring the Pan-Arab movement and views about what it meant to be an Arab at this time. And uh, But it's interesting that you find this comment in this uh, student, this Arab Students Congress document of 1938, that the interests of the Jews settled in Arab lands are not in opposition to the interests of Arab nationalism, but Zionism is directly opposed to Arab nationalism. We must resist it. Should the Jews who are settled among the Arabs not resist it openly, and in earnest, then they will be an enemy to the Arabs. And I think this, this is a particularly interesting question because as, as a lot of this, uh, as the Zionist movement is beginning to gain in steam, and remember 38 would have been at the time of the, of the uh, entrenchment of power of the Third Reich prior to uh, the, uh, the camps, or just as the camps were beginning to be built, the death camps in Europe, uh, prior to the, the Holocaust or the Shoah, and then the, uh, the influx of European Jews into Palestine. Here you find a statement saying, well, look, th there already are Jews living 
in, uh, in Arab lands in Palestine. And some of these were Jews that had been there for millennia. And others were those who had recently come persuaded by Theodore Herzl's argument for the formation of a, uh, of a distinctly Jewish state as a solution to the problem of anti-Semitism. And so he's saying here, the Jews who are already settled in Arab lands, that, that their interests are not, any, are not necessarily in opposition to the interests of Arab nationalism, but Zionism is opposed to Arab nationalism, hence we must resist it. Now, what, what this implies is that Jews were, by this uh, perspective, were in effect considered already to be or to simply be Arabs. So you would have had a, a historical context in which you had Arab Muslims, some Sunni, some Shiite, Arab, uh, Arab Christians, like for instance, Edward Said, who was an Arab Christian. And you had Arab Jews living in this area as well. And so there was in effect an expectation even that many of the Jews who lived in Arab lands would, would themselves be in favor of Arab nationalism or Arabism, Pan-Arabism, in part because they themselves bore a particular Arab identity. Now, uh, in much later, in 2001, Edward Said, prior to his death, make, who, who, again, as I said, was a Palestinian Christian Arab man, came from, in any case, came from that background, although his outlook was predominantly secular, um, but note his definition of pan arabism which is not that different from what we just read in the document from 1938. He says, my def definition of pan-Arabism would comprise the other communities within an Arab Islamic framework. Now, note this is a man of an Arab Christian origin saying this, and his position is not terribly different from that, say, of someone like Michel Aflac in this regard. But he says, including the Jews. So he's thinking of, Jew of Jews who have, who have or should be willing to consider embracing an Arab identity within what he's calling an Arab Islamic uh, framework. Now, the, the Israeli Jew who was interviewing Saeed said, you know, many Jews would find that particular perspective frightening. And here's how Saeed responded. He said, as a Jew, you obviously have good reasons to be afraid, but in the long run, one should move toward less anxiety rather than more anxiety. All right, well, I don't wanna uh, get into all of the complexities that are uh, that are entailed by this question that, that Said raises in 2001. However, I just wanted to note for, from this particular perspective that in, in the early you know, uh, part of the 20th century, during the formation of the Jew Jewish nationalist movement and as Arab nationalist movements were on the horizon and the era of decolonization, that there was, there was in effect an expectation that Jews would be that Jews living in Arab lands would be supportive of the Pan Arab movement, and that they or that they should be supportive of it in any case, rather than supportive of the Zionist movement. Again, going back to the Arab Students Congress pledge, uh, it stated um, the interests of the Jews settled in Arab lands are not in opposition to the interests of Arab nationalism, but Zionism is opposed to Arab nationalism. So therefore. We must resist it. And, and should any Jews living in Arab lands, let's say Arab Jews uh, living in Palestine, should they be, uh, you know, supportive of Zionism, then they will then become an enemy to the Arabs. So this, this is the view at this particular juncture in history. And it's interesting to note that Saeed's going to, uh, you know, going to echo that view, you know, many, many years later. And uh, a lot of these questions are not settled, so they're worth reflecting upon and putting in this historical framework as well. Um, many of the Israeli Jews who came to Palestine came, uh, the early Zionists were European Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, but there were a significant number of Arab Jews living in Palestine as well. And the expectation was that they would be supportive of the Pan-Arab movement. Okay, at least among the Pan-Arabists. Now, Behum, again, as I said, he's a particularly interesting, this essay, because he gives us what I would consider to be a, a fairly representative glimpse of, of what the Arab perspective would have been on many of the claims that the Jews who came to Palestine from Europe made about the so-called promised land. He says, if the right of the Jews to Palestine is to be recognized on the basis of ancient history, let's say the time of King David and King Solomon, 
It will be necessary, he says, to review this history in order to prove that the Arabs have more right to the country than the Jews because they preceded them in it, and that they had in Syria and beyond it kings and states, even before Islam, called upon them to conquer the world. So the claim, the, the counterclaim then is going to be made, well, Jews are going to make this claim, well, Arabs have the right to make, you know, claims that are even much richer and older, far more ancient and, and enduring and more representative of the actual history of the region than the Jews coming to Palestine from Europe. So this, again, as I said, it gives us, it gives us a glimpse of, of what local perspectives are on the emergent Zionist enterprise in Palestine. Okay, so now here, this map shows us the biblical view of what King David's empire would have looked like. This would have been at the apex of the kingdom of Israel, and this would have been 1,000 years before Christ, 3,000 years ago from our point in history. And this would have been this, this golden era uh, when King David ruled, and then later his son Solomon ruled, and then in the next generation, the kingdom began to fragment. So, so the kingdom or this empire would then have lasted about the equivalent of two, two and a half generations. And this is going to be very important from, say, the perspective of somebody like Behum, who's going to want to insist that it was that this history was a relatively short, let's say, blip. And the long and the longer context of the history of the various kingdoms and peoples who've lived in this area for for many many millennia, and so here's what Balaam says: the Old Testament, which the Jews composed on the principle that they were the chosen people, gives a picture of Jewry which deludes the reader into the belief that this constitutes the history of the whole world. Some followers of divine scripture have fully recognized the Old Testament in spite of the blemishes it contains, blemishes which do Israel no credit and their prophets no honor. Now this is, uh, this is characteristic of the Islamic response to some of the claims that are made in the Old Testament. And again, uh, because I can't uh, assume that my uh, listeners or the readers of this document are, are that aware of this history. Let me just say very briefly, I don't want to get into this too deeply, but you see there on the far left, the Torah in the middle of the, the Christian Bible. And then on the right, you see a, a young boy reading the Quran. Quran means oral recitation. Now the Quran is a holy book for Arab peoples, uh, which also has many of the same stories in the Torah and uh, the Christian uh, scriptures as well. The prophets are all the same. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, however, the point that Bayum is making is a point worth reflecting upon for those. Let's say if you're if you're coming at it from an American perspective, an American culture, European culture historically is influenced by the Judeo-Christian tradition, and 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 the biblical scriptures from the Christian tradition, which the Old Testament contains the first five books of what's called the Torah. And the Judaic tradition, now if you're Jewish, obviously you don't call it the Old Testament. It's still, there's nothing old about it. It's still the primary scriptural text. But for Christians, the claim is going to be that the New Testament supersedes the Old Testament. But what Bayum is saying here is that, let's say if you're a Christian, even if you believe that the Jewish scriptures are superseded by the New Testament or the, the, the Gospels, Nonetheless, the stories of the Old Testament, the scriptures of the Old Testament, are contained within the Bible. Now, many, many Christians, for instance, are, even, are not even aware that these same stories, many of these same figures appear in the pages of the Quran because Christians don't read the Quran, uh, but they do read the Jewish scriptures, even if they believe that the Gospels supersede them. And so... He's, he's drawing attention to this fact of how this then, therefore, the, the Jewish view of history is then becomes then hegemonic, let's say, in the Western Christian European context. And from the Muslim perspective, the Jewish scriptures and the Christian scriptures are indeed legitimate revealed, uh, you know, the revealed word of God. However, uh, Muslims believe that Jewish uh peoples, Jewish uh, adherents, and Christian adherents did not carefully preserve their revealed scriptures, and even in some cases may have made changes to the text. And so therefore, 
none of the neither one of these scriptures is terribly reliable, even though they are considered to be authentic, uh, revealed, you know, words of God. And so if we go back then and look at what Bayum is saying, then he's saying uh, that, you know, some of the followers of divine scriptures, this could be Jews and Christians alike, have fully recognized the Old Testament in spite of the blemishes it contains. Now, I'll give you one uh, quick instance of this. Like, for instance, the story of Lot and his daughters. When Lot gets drunk, uh, his daughters get him drunk, and then they have they, he fornicates with his daughters, and then they have two children from this union, um, the uh, Ben Ami becomes the uh, Ammonites, and, and uh, just, just as one uh, instance of that, which then becomes an entire group of people. Now, this, this story in the Old Testament, from the Islamic perspective, is said not to even have uh, occurred at all. And so, the, for instance, from the Islamic perspective, you'd say, well, this is an obvious instance of a change that was made in the text, because it would not be uh, a prophet like Lot, who is considered to be an authentic prophet from the Islamic perspective, would have no way engaged in this kind of behavior uh, because prophets don't behave in that fashion. So that's just one quick instance. There are many other uh, instances of this that we could, or claims that are you know made from let's say the Islamic perspective. But but I would just the takeaway here is that from the Arab Muslim perspective, looking at some of these claims. The Old Testament itself is not a particularly reliable indicator of that history. It gives, in effect, a distorted view of history, which many of the people who live in this world would reject, but Jews would accept and Christians would, would assume to be true because that's what they've been presented with. That's They don't know about these alternative uh, histories. They, own, they get it all from this one perspective and so granted credence that one that they sh perhaps should not by whom is claiming right so hopefully that will paraphrase for you what he's saying in this instance if again if you're coming to this these ideas for the first time so here's what Bayum says all followers of divine scriptures have succumbed to jewish influences in their view of history they have indeed believed in their prophets and looked on ancient history through their windows and have become the mouthpiece of jewish view so this could be true of European and American Christians, for instance. The consequences of this have been that the Jews, though dispersed and humiliated for thousands of years, have been able to preserve their domination over those who hold, hold sacred the books of the Old Testament, which again would include the Christians as well as the Jews, and who devote themselves to studies in their schools and institutes. This explains how the Americans became greatly interested in the books of the Old Testament ever since they came to be concerned with Eastern affairs and started to study the history of Eastern peoples and countries. Now, I think, you know, uh, there is a, th this argument, there's a certain degree of legitimacy to this argument. Uh, because again, if, if you're an American and let's say you've grown up reading the Old Testament, whether you're Jewish or Christian, then that can, and like let's say it's these stories are taught to children in Sunday schools and in, in Christian context and synagogue and the Jewish context. He's saying that that really deeply shapes their perception of the history of the region. And so then they've become sort of closed off to, to broader perspectives that are more characteristics of how Arab uh, Muslim peoples view this same history in, in, in the context of, of the Middle East. So it's a good point. It's, it's definitely worth considering and, and reflecting upon. You know, are, are Americans, whether you're Jewish or Christian or even agnostic, if you've been influenced by this history, does, do you, do you pre-understand the history or, or do you have a certain, you know, prejudice about the history? Now I'm, I'm saying the word prejudice, let's say in it's God Amerian sense, not necessarily as a stigmatized term, but let's say faculties of prejudging that we need, that we bring with us to bear upon our understanding of history and of the text of history itself. And so we should, we should be, Behum is right in reminding us that we should be cognizant of these so-called pre faculties of prejudgment that we carry with us. Okay, um, the Holy Land, he says, which was the birthplace of Christ and Christianity and a first quibla for Muhammad and the Muslims, this means uh, in the early days of Islam, prior to uh, the change that Muhammad made in terms of face of, of prayer, Muslims prayed facing Mecca, excuse me, prayed facing Jerusalem, and then Muhammad changed it to facing 
uh, Mecca. So Jerusalem was and remains a holy city for Muslims uh, from the earliest days of uh, the formation of Islam. But it was never Jewish. Okay, And even, for instance, even the name of Jerusalem itself is not called Jerusalem if you're an Arab Muslim. It's called Al-Quds. Uh, so the, even the, the name of Jerusalem is, is different uh, from an Arab Muslim perspective. And Arab Muslims never thought of Jerusalem as a particularly Jewish city. It was always thought of as being a city uh, for those who lived in the region and looked at it through an Arab Islamic lens. Uh, as, as the Jews represented in the Old Testament and as those who drink knowledge from Jewish sources still represent. This would again be the Christians. On the contrary, the Holy Land was a fatherland for the Arabs before the coming of the Hebrews. It was a fatherland for them even when the Jews were in Palestine, and so it remained until Arabism overspread Palestine during the Islamic period. So let's note the broad view that he's taking of what it means to be an Arab in this essay is that Arabs were there in the Holy Land before Hebrew or Jewish peoples uh, came and they were there after the Jewish people and Hebrews left. So for, for Behum, it is a, 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 it is a fatherland for Arabs, as it has always been. The Jews, he says, contend that Genesis makes Palestine a holy land because of Abraham's residence in it. The whole world went along with the Jews in this belief on the basis of the Holy Scriptures, whereas, in fact, the Hebrews were at that period mere aliens in the land of the Canaanites. Okay, quite quite interesting argument. So now we're getting uh, the, the, the viewpoint from the Arab Muslim perspective, which takes this broader view of history, which goes, which and, and, uh, and within which to be an Arab, what it means to be an Arab is something that is much older than Islam itself. Even in their golden age, the Hebrews were still considered by their neighbors, the Canaanites, as intruders. This would have been during the days of King David. The Jews did not control an area of Palestine more extensive than 120 miles. Their golden age was very short-lived and did not last longer than the reign of Solomon, the son of David. This is not merely the result of Palestine's military situ situation vis-a-vis -vis the neighboring powers, but also of the constant rivalries and quarrels of the Jewish tribes and their selfishness and cruelty, which led both compatriots and strangers to hate them. The golden age of the Jews, which did not exceed 40 years, that is, Solomon's reign was of no account in comparison with the periods of other conquerors, whether in ancient or modern times. So what Bayum wants to underscore is they didn't, the, the, the Hebrews, the, Israelite, the Israelites, the Jews who during the days of King David and King Solomon, that it was a very short period and it was not a very um, vast territory. It was about 120 miles total. And there were many other kingdoms that came and went during that time. This was just one, from Bahum's perspective, this would have been just one blip in a, in a much vaster, grander, and richer his, regional history. So if we look here now on the far left at 587 BCE, 587 years before Christ or before the Common Era, this would have this was an image of what the uh, Temple of Solomon, the son of King David, would have looked like in the year it was destroyed in the year 587. Now Herod's temple uh, was destroyed in the year 70. So it was you know it's interesting to note that Herod's temple was was destroyed and was built shortly after shortly before it was destroyed. But it was you know it was built 500 years after the time of Solomon's temple. That's that's quite a stretch of history. But then the Romans destroyed it and they banned the Jews from living in Israel, which then uh, caused the diaspora to happen. And uh, the uh, this is uh, an image on the far right of the Al-Aqsa Mosque or the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, which is built on this, the, the, the temple, I should say the temple of Solomon was built on the same site as the temple of Herod. And the temple and the and the uh, dome of the rock, the mosque of the rock, uh, was built on the same site as well. So this is one of the reasons why it's so contested. But let's let's note that uh, this mosque would have been built very early in the. Now it was there was a mosque that was built there that was destroyed and then it was rebuilt. But the first mosque that was built on the site um, was uh, appeared very early in the Islamic period, and so. It, we might know 
1300 years ago. And so there is this contested history uh, and all three of these peoples claiming uh, Christians, Jews and Muslims claiming some, you know, privilege and right to this territory. And that re that is one of the reasons why it remains contested. But, but, but what Bayoum wants to insist is that the history of the Jewish people in this region was a relatively short history in the larger historical context of Islam and Arab peoples living in this region even earlier than the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Here's Bayhum. Arabism in Palestine and in the rest of Syria was not only a thousand years older than Hebraism, but through the Canaanites, the Edomites, and others remained in existence all the time the Jews were present in Palestine and after their evacuation from it. When Abraham came to Palestine in the second millennium BC, Syria was inhabited by Canaanites who had come from the Arabian Peninsula a thousand years earlier. So these are very, uh, it's interesting because this, these are very ancient histories and Bayhum wants to insist, underscore uh, the, the ancient nature of these cultures. Now this is obviously a very different view than the Zionist view, you know, proclaiming that they're coming to a land, you know, a, a land uh, without people for a people without land. By humans to say, no, there have been people on this land for thousands of years, ancient, rich, deep cultures. And so it certainly was not an empty land that the uh, European Jews came to when they colonized uh, Palestine or when they established the uh, independent state of Israel, however one wants to look at it in a political sense. So here on the, on the left, you see an image from Canaanite history. And on the right, this would have been the city, of, an ancient city of the Edomites. These would have been, this would have been a city uh, that was by legend attributed to the followers of Esau, Jacob's uh, older brother, whom he tricks by tripping him up by the heel. But these are places you can see in this map, you can see what the names of some of these old kingdoms. Uh, Ammon, I said earlier, Lot's daughter was said to have relations with her father and uh, Ben-Ami was born. He becomes the father of the Ammon Ammonites. The other sister had becomes the uh, Lot and his other daughter become the father of the Moabites. From, from the Arab Islamic perspective, this biblical story was invented to discredit the claims of the of non you know Hebraic peoples living in the lands by attributing to them an ignoble origin, which is one of the reasons why it's rejected as a not reliable uh, text in the uh, in the Torah or in the in the Christian uh, Old Testament. So if, if you're Muslim, you know, one does, if you're Arab Muslim, you do accept the uh, status of the Torah as the revealed word of God, but, but one that has been, you know, changed, mishandled, and so therefore not reliable. This, this is the Islamic perspective, and wh whereas the Quran is said to be perfectly uh, inerrant, per perfectly uh, preserved, and therefore more reliable. But in any case, you can see there the Canaanites uh, were, you know, hem, hemmed in the ancient kids, uh, kingdom of Israel, as did the, the Philistines. They're there. These, this gives you a sense of the other uh, peoples living in the land during the period of David and Solomon, and were there, according to uh, uh, Behum, long before uh, the, is, the Israelites came and founded their kingdom. Now, here's what Behum says. He says, as for the Zionists, I mean, he would mean, in this case, he means the European Jews who've very recently come to Palestine, who have come falsely pretending that they had more right to Palestine than the Arabs, and who have filled the earth with cries and lamentations. Most of them are Khazars who became Jews in the middle of the 8th century AD. What right had they to Palestine? Now, Behum is referring to a uh, a, a view of history that the Jewish people were, that, that the European Jewish people were in a sense linked to the, the Khazar uh, uh, Kaganite from 650 to 850. This would have been a, a, a federation of Khazars that uh, were, some of whom converted to Jews. This is how the argument goes. But they converted to Judaism as a religion, but were not themselves ethnically Jewish. This this is an argument that some historians have made, uh, but it's one that uh, here here's an image you can see of what some of these Khazars might have looked like. So that they were not. He's he's saying in effect, or he's making the claim that these Khazars were not themselves uh, people that were the original inhabitants of Palestine to begin with, but they were 
local people, Khazars, who embraced Judaism as a religion without ethnically being Jewish or ethnically having a Middle Eastern origin. This, this is the claim. Now, here's a, a, a claim by an Israeli historian that counters this argument, or Jewish historian Alexander Bader, I should say Jewish, I'm not sure if he's Israeli or not. He says, archaeological evidence about the widespread existence of Jews in Khazaria is almost non-existent. While a series of independent sources does testify to the existence in the 10th century of Jews in the kingdom of Khazaria, and while some of these sources also indicate that the ruling elite of Khazaria embraced Judaism, we can be confident that Judaism was not particularly widespread in that kingdom. And so he's, he's refuting this claim. Now, it's, it's, it is, uh, and I, again, you can pursue this yourself. I don't want to make any claims about who's right or who's wrong in this, but I think it is worth noting that many during the period of the diaspora, when Jews lived all over you know, Europe and in, in Khazar as well, as, as Bader here is acknowledging, there was, there was plenty of inter- marrying, intermingling with the peoples who live in the, uh, in, in the regions where Jews migrated to after the Romans destroyed uh, Herod's temple and forbade them from living in Jerusalem. So uh, this is the debate. Anyway, it's, it's up for you. You can look it up yourself and see, see what you think about that. But this is what Behum is claiming, that, that the, uh, many of the Ashkenazi Jews were not themselves even ethnically from the region of Israel. And this is, this is a common view that you'll hear in, say, Jordan, Palestine, and so on, that, that, you're, that Jewish people, let's say, if you're people who are, let's say, even of European Jewish origin, say French Jewish origin, people with blonde hair and blue eyes, that they're not from uh, the Levant. They're not somatic, in effect. This is a claim that many uh, uh, of those who are opposed to the Zionist a project in Palestine will make Arab Muslims, particularly Arab Christians as well, in Palestine. Okay, here's Behum in 1957. He says, the aim of this exposition has been to show those who dwell among the Arabs and those outside Arab countries who have been taken in by Zionist propaganda and have been bewitched by the magic of Jewry that the art, historical arguments of the Jews are not based on the truth, and that in any event, they do not constitute a right to expel a people from their country barefoot and naked in order to replace them with the scum of the earth. The purification of Palestine depends on strength alone. Such a thing is not difficult for the Arabs, even though the Jews in the West support each other. So now, uh, Behum referring to the, my, the people who've come to Palestine uh, after the Shoah, after the Holocaust, as scum of the earth is, is a pretty harsh statement, a pretty offensive statement, obviously racist, really, and one must acknowledge. Um, but, uh, you know, nonetheless, uh, he is, um, he does have a certain valid point that I think we have, we have to take into consideration, at least whether, who, whatever view one might take on this question, I think, I think one does need to ask oneself is, are the historical arguments of the Jews based on truth or are they based on a, on a, on a historical uh, myth? And certainly from Behum's perspective, they are based on historical myths. Uh, he's, he's uh, very angry, obviously. And remember though, the context when, when Israel is founded and the Declaration of Independence in 19. 48. This is also from the uh, Palestinian perspective, from the Arab perspective, the era of the catastrophe when many Arabs, as he's describing here, are dr were driven from their home barefoot and naked. Many went into uh, Jordan, for instance. Many went into Lebanon. Many went into Syria, were, were divested of their homeland, and they were indeed replaced with a new people. Now, he views them as scum of the earth. That's his hostile, and that's obviously his hostile, even racist view. Um, however, he is describing uh, historical facts here that did indeed take place. Um, what is the justification for the, this project? This is, this is the question. This is the main question that he's asking. But he, he ends up with a militant view. He's hostile and uh, he wants a militant solution to the problem, to what he's calling here, quote unquote, the purification of Palestine. So he is demanding a solution that we can fairly describe as ethnic cleansing. Uh, and he says, 
in conclusion, only yesterday we thought it difficult to evacuate the French from Syria and Lebanon. We then thought it difficult to expel France by force from Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria. We did not believe it possible to uh, extricate Transjordan from the embrace of Great Britain and to expel Glub Pasha or to liberate Iraq from the British army uh, of occupation or to expel Great Britain from Egypt. We used to think all this almost unattainable whenever we compared our forces to the gigantic forces of the West. And so Bayoum then, this, what, what I think is worth noting then is he's, he's very clearly linking the arrival of European Jews from the continent of Europe into Palestine as a part of the, of the colonial project. And so he, he does indeed see it as a form of settler colonialism. And he's, 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 he's making this argument in the context of decolonization movements, which were taking place across the globe at that time when the French were being expelled from North Africa, also Vietnam, uh, and, and the British were being removed from England, excuse me, from, uh, from Jordan and from uh, Iraq. And so he's putting it, he's definitely putting it in that context. Now, uh, this text you'll find in Sylvia Haim's Arab Nationalism and Anthology. This is, to my opinion, it remains the best source out there from the literature of that period. Uh, this is an older, my own version of it is an older text, but there are more recent versions of it as well. And so if you would like to learn more about this history, this is where I would urge you to go.